making sure that we are recording. All right, so that's good. Um, and then we'll resume the discussion of subroutines, okay? Um, I think last time with this class, I stopped just short of talking about uh, recursion, which is basically a subroutine that can call itself, that can invoke itself. So that's what we'll start today, is to have a subroutine that can invoke itself. Um, recursion is a topic that most of the time is reserved here for a higher level class, you know, for a community college like this one. Most of the time they don't talk about it until like CISB 430, which is like two classes away from this class, two or three. Um, but I think you guys are ready, okay? Because I think a lot of times you know, people don't want to talk about recursion because um, they tend to overthink it. Okay, so the key to understand recursion is not to overthink it, you know, but to think about it as just like any other subroutine invocation. So we'll start with that today, because I think it's a really good test, you know, whether we actually understand uh, recursion, you know, understand subroutine calls or not. <clears throat> so that's what we'll do today. First, is to start with a recursive algorithm. So there we go, we have our spreadsheet up and running. And we'll define the subroutine. And I'll just kind of bring up stuff you know, from last uh, Thursday in case people are starting to forget, oh, you know, what did we talk about last Thursday? We talked about the concept of subroutines. So in this case, you know, define sub x, y, z is, uh, marks the beginning of a subroutine, the definition of a subroutine. And you know, just because you define a subroutine doesn't mean that it's going to be used inside an algorithm. You have to invoke a subroutine in order for the code contained within the definition to do any work. So in this case, I'm defining this subroutine to have a name of XYZ so that when I use the invoke statement, I can say invoke XYZ to identify which subroutine I'm invoking. You can have you know, literally thousands and thousands of subroutines in a practical program. <clears throat> do each one is only about 20, 30, you know, 50 lines long, but together they can do a lot of work. So what we'll do is we'll define this subroutine to start with a conditional statement, and we'll just say that if x is uh, greater than zero, then we'll do the following. The first thing we do is we'll subtract one from x first, and then we'll invoke the subroutine x, y, z, and if, and define sub. All right. So the, first, the other thing we have to do is to change the indentation, just so that you know, it shows you know, which part is contained within which part here. So as we can see now, you know, with the correct indentation, <coughs> um, the subroutine consists of one single conditional statement. And inside the conditional statement, we have a single assignment statement to change the value of x to decre decrement the value by 1 and also invoke another invoke statement, which invokes the same subroutine that we are in. And then outside of the definition of the subroutine, starting on line seven, we have our actual program. We start here. Uh, the first line is, I'm gonna initialize x to a particular value. Let's say it starts with a value of two. And then we go to line eight, and line eight is going to invoke the subroutine i n b o k e x y z. And you know what? We'll do the same thing on line nine, okay? Just to see what happens when we invoke X, Y, Z twice um, in a row, okay? All right, so this is our um, algorithm to consider. Um, is there anything here that we have not talked about? We talked about subroutines last Thursday, okay? We talked about how to invoke a subroutine last Thursday. We have, you know, we definitely know what a subroutine is. I mean, a conditional statement on line two, from line two to line five is a conditional statement. Uh, we definitely understand the assignment statements, uh, which would be, there are two assignment statements here on line three and also on line seven. So there should not be anything that we have not talked about, okay? And the key to understand this particular algorithm or to understand what it does is really up to apply what we have learned so far. Okay, just because line four, the invoke statement, it's inside the subroutine, we have done that too, last Thursday, okay? Except on last Thursday, when we have an invoke inside a definition of a subroutine, it was invoking another subroutine instead of itself. But the mechanism to invoke a subroutine does not change whether you're invoking somebody else or the very same subroutine that you're already in, okay? 
So let's go ahead and do a trace this algorithm and see you know, what it's going to do. <coughs> Now, with um, subroutines, a lot of times you know, we will have to you know, kind of allocate additional columns. So I'm just going to you know, keep the algorithm itself a little bit you know, small in terms of fonts you know, at this point. Um, and we'll focus on the trays, starting with comments, because we do have a condition on line 2 to evaluate. We have the usual line number, and we have one you know, variable x used in this particular algorithm. So those are the initial columns that we have to create in order to keep track of you know, what this program is going to do. <clears throat> Where should I start execution? Line seven. Line seven, that is correct, because line seven is the first line that is not inside the definition of a subroutine. So we only start um, programs or algorithms, in this case, uh, from the first line that is outside of the definition of a subroutine. Later on, we'll start to use the convention used in C and C++, but right now we will, we'll still use this particular convention, which is actually also true and applicable when you're, de when you're dealing with scripting languages, such as you know, Perl, PHP, they all, have, you know, they all follow this particular convention. On line seven, nothing really too interesting is happening because x just you know, uh, get, a, get a value of two. And then on line eight, we have you know, our first invoke statement. In this particular program, there are three lines that are invoke statements. There's line four, there's line eight, and there's line nine. But the way we treat these lines, or the way they operate, is exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether it's from line four, line eight, or line nine, an invoke statement still has to do exactly the same thing, or exactly the same two things, okay? So each one has two things to do. Now that we are on line nine, we have two things to do. The first thing to do is to allocate the leftmost available column and then use it to remember the return line number. The return line number tells us where are we supposed to continue execution when we, have, when we reach the end of the subroutine that we are invoking here. So the first thing we do is to label column D return line number because otherwise we don't know what the, what the value means in this column. The return line number typically is you know, just literally the line following the invoke statement. But sometimes it's not. Like, we'll, like I will show you on line four, it is not exactly line five, but instead it's line six. But basically what it is is you know, which line is logically following the invoke statement. In this case, line eight and nine are sequential. And as a result, you know, after line eight, well, we should continue on to line nine. So the return line number is just simply nine to represent line nine is the continuation. That's the first step of um, invoking a subroutine. The second step of invoking a subroutine, after you remember where you're supposed to go back to, now you can safely go to the subroutine and continue execution. In this case, the invoke statement tells us to, to continue execution in subroutine x, y, z, and the first line in subroutine x, y, z that actually does something useful is line two. So now we continue execution on line two. So line two is the beginning of a conditional statement. So we have to evaluate the condition first. X is greater than zero is true because X currently has a value of two. So now we have to go to line three. Line three is just a regular assignment statement. X gets X minus one, so X becomes one at this point. And then we continue execution onto line four. Line four is an invoke statement, so we have to do exactly the same two things that we did on line eight, except you know we'll use a different column and it will have a different return line number. Remember, the first thing we have to do is to allocate the leftmost available column. The leftmost available column in this case is column E because column D is already in use. We label it return line number, and then we have to ask. Okay, when we come back right. from this invocation of X, Y, Z, where are we supposed to continue execution? It's not line five, okay? Because we don't trace line five in this case, in this class, because line five really doesn't do anything. It's just marking the end of the conditional statement. So when we come back from this invocation of, of X, Y, Z, we have to continue execution on line six. So that's why the return line number in this case is line six and not line five. So it's not always just literally what is next to the line or what is following the line that we are tracing. 
it, it is, you know, logically what line is going to follow the line that has the invoke statement. Now that we re remember that we're supposed to go back to line six after the second invocation of XYZ, we can now go continue execution inside the subroutine that we're invoking. The fact that we are inside the subroutine doesn't change the fact that we have to start from the beginning of the subroutine every time we invoke a subroutine. So in this case, even though we were on line four, which is in the subroutine that we are actually invoking, it doesn't matter. We still have to begin from, we have to start from the beginning of the subroutine, which is on line two. So once again, we evaluate x is greater than zero. And it is still true in this case, because at this point, x has a value of one. Then we move on to line three. Line three is going to decrement the value of x, so it goes from one down to zero, and then we move on to line four. On line four, we do exactly the same thing. We allocate the leftmost available column, which is now column F, label it return line number, so we know what this column is used for, and then we indicate when this invocation is done, where are we supposed to continue execution? It's line six, because once again, we do not trace line five, so we have to go to line six instead. That's the, fr that's the first step of invoking a subroutine, and then we continue execution in the subroutine that we're invoking, starting from the first line in the subroutine. In this case, you know, it is line two. So once again, we evaluate a condition, x is greater than zero. This time, it is false, because x has a value of zero already at this point, okay? Now, just based on what you already understand about conditional statements, where are we going next? We are on line two right now. The condition is false. Where are we going to go? Line six. Okay, we go to line six, not line seven. Line six because end defined sub actually has things to do, important things to do. Okay, so we cannot go to line seven. Okay, we have to get to the end of the subroutine, which is line six. We inside the subroutine, we're now getting to the end of that particular subroutine. On line six, or every time you get to end define sub, you have two things to do. The first thing you have to do is to look up the rightmost active return line number column. Which one is my rightmost active return line number column? F. Column F. And column F is telling me to go continue execution where? Line six. On line six. Well, but we are on line six already. It's okay, okay? It is okay that we are on line six and yet the return line number is telling us to continue execution also on line six. So I'm gonna make a note here to say that I will continue execution on line six. I'm actually on line six right now, okay? But I will continue execution on the same line because that's what the return line number is telling me. But that's, oh, that's only the first thing I'm supposed to do when we're at the end of a subroutine. The second thing we have to do at the end of a subroutine is to deallocate the return line of a column because I won't need it anymore. In this case, column F is no longer in use because, just, because I just made a note of where to continue execution. So at this point, this column is no longer useful. So what I do is I will just do a right click, uh, format cells, and change it to use strike through to indicate that at this point I'm deallocating the return line number and I apply the formatting just a little bit too much to the entire row. So I'm gonna change this one back to without the strike through. Okay, there we go. And now we are on at line six again because that's what the return line number of column F told me to go. Okay, so now I'm on line six again. And once again, what do we do when we're at the end of a subroutine? retrieve the rightmost active return line number column. In this case, it's not column F anymore. Column F is now deallocated. So the rightmost active one is now column E, but guess what? Column E is telling me to continue execution on line six again. All right, I'll make a note of that. I will continue execution on line six, and just like last time, I have no use of column E at this point, so I'm gonna deallocate it just by you know, writing return line number with a strike through. And now I'm on line, six, on line six again, which is end defined sub. So I'm gonna do exactly the same thing, which is look up the, the right most active return line number. Column E is deallocated, column F is deallocated. So now I'm down to column D, which tells me 
that I have to continue execution on line 9. All right, so I'll make a note of that, and then I have no use of column D anymore. It is now deallocated. And here I am on line 9 in order to continue execution. Are there any questions at this point about this program or the tracing of this particular algorithm up to this point? <coughs> <coughs> yep, go ahead. Um, after row 14. After row 14. Yeah, you had two <coughs> because what again? The first, I know how to, I just don't know how you got the first two sixes instead of just one. The first six, okay. <clears throat> the, the line six of row 15 is simply because we got out of the conditional statement. So the conditional statement goes from line two to line five. So if I get out of the conditional statement because x is no longer less greater than zero, um, I continue execution on line six. Okay, so that accounts for this line six of line 15. But because line six is n defined sub, that means I have to retrieve the line number from the rightmost active return line of a column, which told me to continue execution on line six. And that's how I got the line six of row 16 is you know, because of the return line number telling me to continue execution there. Yeah. Okay, all right. So now that we are on row 18 of the trace, we are continue, continuing execution on line nine. Line nine is an invoke statement, so it has two steps to do. The first one is to allocate the leftmost available column. The leftmost available column is column D again, because I just deallocated it. So I can reallocate column D and say, okay, I'm gonna use it to remember the uh, return line number again. This time, the invoke statement is on line nine, which is the last line of the entire program. So there's really nothing after this. If there's nothing after it, that's okay. We can return to post. And then we continue execution in the subroutine starting on line two in this case. Line two is re-evaluating x is greater than zero. X is still zero at this point, so the condition is false. We skip the entire conditional statement and land up, end up on line six. Line six has got two things to do. One is to locate the rightmost available, the rightmost active return line number. We only got one now, which is column D. It told us is telling us to continue execution at post. So we'll make a note of that. And then we have no use of column D anymore, and then we just mark it as deallocated, and then we continue execution here, which means, hey, we are already at the end of the entire trace, we're done. And so you can't have it. So the goal is for you to have no return line numbers um, without them being crossed, crossed out. out. That is correct, yep. If you trace a program with subroutines correctly, you should end up with you know, all the columns dynamically allocated to be deallocated. The issue balance. All right. Are there any questions about this trace? Professor, so yep. how did you get return line, the return line number six? How did you get number six? On which row? It's on row E. It says return line number six. That one? You mean yeah, here? Well, why not return line number four? Because if you return back to line number four, then you'll be invoking again. It will become endless. So you have to continue execution with whatever is following the invoke statement. So to get to the end? To the end? To lo what, is log to what is logically following line four in this case? What is logically follow following line four is not line five, because we don't trace line five. What is logically following this line four is line six. So that's why we remember line six as the return line number. All right. Any other questions related to recursion? When you when you when you go from uh, row one to seven. Row one to the, seven. The beginning. Because we start execution with the first line that is outside of the definition of a subroutine. Any other questions? No other questions? Really? Okay. Can well, we do another one? Hmm? Can we do 
Oh, we'll do we'll do plenty of recursion. Don't worry. <laughs> but I'm I'm kind of glad that you guys are enthusiastic and want to do more. But before we do any more, I kind of want to explain uh, what recursion really is, and you know, do we really need to write programs this way? Okay, so that's kind of more of a theoretical kind of question, and not really that you know, it's not a practical kind of thing. All right. So yep, go ahead. Are you ever gonna give us a, a trace that we gotta write out the algorithm? You will trace the algorithm. I give you the algorithm, you trace it, just like you know, with the first exam and all the previous homework assignments. Okay. But the complexity does increase, okay? So this is just the beginning of using subroutines. So subroutines will go kind of far, you know, because you know there's a lot of stuff we can do with subroutines that are very useful. Okay, so the question now is, you know, why do we want to deal with this? I mean, other than, oh, it, it looks kind of fun, okay? You know, we have a subroutine that can invoke itself. Well, in reality, it is useful too, okay? There are certain things or certain mathematical concepts that are recursive in this definition. So we'll take a look at one that is, you know, basically totally overused, you know, by you know, today's standard. Let's look at factorial, okay? And I'm going to use a text editor for that purpose, you know, just so that, you know, this becomes a part of the recording for this class. So the factorial of a number, I'm going to use a solid, you know, concrete example here. Let's take a look at three factorial. Three factorial is three times two times one. Okay, that's the definition of a factorial. Is it is a product of the number itself, one less than that, one two less than that, and so on until it gets down to one. Okay, so this is three factorial. Um, we can look at five factorial. Okay, five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. Um, so are there any questions about the concept of factorial? Do they go by prime numbers or they can start no, anywhere? you can start with any number. Okay. In fact, in general, if you want to look at a number n and it's factorial, it is, you know, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, blah, 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 all the way down to 1. Okay? That's kind of one way to look at the definition of factorial. It's, it's just a product of n and all the numbers between it and 1. That's it. Okay. Um, well, let's kind of take a little digression at this point. What is the whole point of you know, factorial? Because I don't want to talk about something that is useless. I mean, you know, why do we want to talk about this? I mean, if it's not, it has no practical application, then we should not talk about stuff like that. So what do you think is a practical use of factorial? We kind of talked about this a little bit before when we talked about the traveling salesman problem, pizza delivery. Remember that? I don't think we talked about that. Oh, we didn't talk about that? No. Okay, let's talk about that one first. And then there's actually another really practical example of using factorial. So let's say you are you know, delivering pizza, okay? So you have you know, the shop here. And then you have you know, various points you know, that you have, you're supposed to del deliver the pizza to. So you have, you know, let's say point A is here, point B is here, point C is here, and then point D is here. So your objective is to traverse, you know, start with a shop, okay, the, the pizza shop, and then go to you know, points A, B, C, and D in a way so that you know, when you complete the entire route and return to the shop, you'll be using the least amount of time. Okay, so it's an optimization problem. I want to spend the least amount of time to traverse you know, points A, B, C, and D, and there's no real priority. Like, I always have to go, go to point A first, okay? They, you can reorder things as many times as you want to. So the question is, how many different ways can you traverse points A, B, C, and D? Um, and that basically shows you how many possible routes there are in order for you to consider. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the first one, okay? If you start with, you know, point A, then you have, you know, B as the second choice. You can have B as a second choice, and then you can have okay, C, and then D. C and then D. Okay, so once you have, you know, A, B, C, D, well, there are no more options because you have just locked down, you know, every single point. But you can keep A and B here and then change the second last point to D. That also locks down the last point to, you know, to become C. So this will exhaust you know, all the routes starting with A and B. 
But you know what? You can start with C also as your second point, which means you can use B as your third point and then use D as your last point. So you can come up with a list like this all the way down to, you know, if you follow this, you know, logic here, it will get you down to D, C, B, A as the last choice. So the question is how many different routes do I have, you know, in this case? How many possible routes do I need to consider? So it's five factorial. It'd be four factorial. It will be four factorial because the first one, you have four choices, okay? But once you lock down the first point, you only got three choices left as your second choice. After you lock down the first and the second choice, you got two choices left for the third choice. But once you lock down the first three points, then the last one is locked down. You don't have a choice anymore. So it becomes four times three times two times one, which turns out to be 24. 24, 24. okay? 24. So there are 24 possible routes, <clears throat> and it's not really a big number. 24 is a fairly you know, small number, especially when you write a program to consider you know, how much time it will take to go from the shop to the first point, second, third, fourth, and then back to the shop. And then you just have to look at all 24 routes, look at the estimated amount of time to traverse you know, the points, and then pick the one that is the shortest. Okay. Now, the criteria doesn't have to be exactly time. It can be fuel also. It can also be based on you know, um, likelihood of accidents and stuff like that. Um, but in any case, you have only 24 routes to consider when you have only four drop-off points, which is kind of realistic for pizza delivery because otherwise you know, the pizza would get, become cold and you know, it doesn't work anymore. What about UPS trucks or FedEx trucks? See. How many stops do they have? Twenty a day or something. Oh no, no, not twenty. <laughs> it's a hundred. Okay, it's in the order of one hundred. Okay, so now you have the starting point, which is um, the UPS, you know, um, shipping center, and then you have a hundred spots. Okay, so the question is, how many possible routes am I going to consider? It doesn't sound too bad because you know this is four. That's a hundred. So maybe twenty-five times, you know, twenty-four. Okay, which is still a reasonably small number. But that's not the case. Because with UPS, the first route, you have 100 choices for the first point. But once you lock down the first point, you have 99 choices for the second point. And then you have 98 pass choices for the third point, and so on. So it becomes 100 factorial. This is the number of possible routes when you have 100 drop off points. Okay? And 100 factorial is a huge number. Okay? Now, how do we know, or how huge of a number are we talking about here? Well, since I'm using a spreadsheet, it is really handy to use a spreadsheet for calculations like that. So I'm just going to borrow this spreadsheet for this factorial calculation. The factorial of 100 is, you know, they just you know, abbreviate factorial to fact like that. It is, well, it doesn't look like a very big number. It's 9.33 plus 157, so it's like 160 something, I mean, uh, close to 170. No, this is a scientific notation. Okay, I'm pretty sure most of you still remember what is a scientific notation. It is saying that this number is 9.333 times 10 to the power of 157. In other words, imagine 9 followed by 157 zeros. That is the magnitude of the number that we are dealing with. Okay, so you can write an algorithm to do something like this. It works well for a pizza shop, but it won't work well for UPS, just because of the sheer number of possible combinations. <coughs> are we doing okay so far with the practical application of factorial? But I'll give you another pr practical application of factorial, lotto. Lotto tickets, okay? When is it worthwhile to buy one? Okay? I'm pretty sure most people you know, want to know that. You know, that's a legitimate, you know, practical question. Is, you know, when do I buy the lotto tickets? So before we do the calculations, let's understand the rules first, okay? So there are not too many classes where the professor will go to, you know, the lotto website and <laughs> actually go through these, you know, calculations. I'm, I'm hoping that your math professor, you know, especially with statistics and probability, will, you know, kind of, you know, use this, you know, also to give you an example how to, of how to use probability, you know, on a, you know, 
kind of daily basis. All right, so what we'll do is we'll look up the rules of a specific game. Okay, so where do we go? Play, and let's talk about, okay, which one has the biggest you know, payoff? Mega Million or Super Lotto Plus? Uh, I think it's Powerball. 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 Yeah. All right, let's do Powerball then. Okay, so we want to look at the rules, you know, how to play. All right, so here, the, so the most important part of you know, doing anything like this is to first understand the rules, okay? Because if you don't understand the rules, then, you know, you don't really have a chance of calculating the probabilities of winning. Okay, so in this case, you know, find, find a Powerball retailer, okay, find, okay. Pick, pick five lucky numbers from one to 59 and one Powerball number from one to 35 on a Powerball play slip, okay. So now th my question is, can this number, the Powerball number, be one of the numbers that you have picked already as going to the, the first of five lucky numbers? It doesn't say, so I'm not 100% sure. What you do you mean, mean? Can they overlap? Can, can they overlap? Say, yes. They can overlap. But only to a point because the, the um, up to 35. The Powerball numbers only go from 1 through, I think, 15. Okay. And then well, 1 to 35, 35 in this case. Yeah, one to thirty-five. Here. Yeah, but so one through thirty-five on the Powerball, but it's one through fifty-nine. Yeah. Okay. Together. All right. So yeah, so one through thirty-five, you can get a one over there and a one over there. Okay. All right. So what we'll do is we'll you know, calculate, you know, how many. Um, okay. Does everybody understand what is the difference between a combination as opposed to a permutation? Okay. So can you do? Do you want to explain it? Order matters. Okay, that's correct. In a permutation, ABC is a different permutation from BCA. Okay, so even though we have the same three elements, it's a different permutation. So with the route, we are only playing with the per permutations because it's the same combination. In a combination, the ordering does not matter. Okay, you have A, B, and C, that's one combination. A, B, D is a different combination because you have a different element in that case. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of combinations? as opposed to permutations. Okay, so once we understand that, we'll take a look at these rules, and then we'll say, you know, okay, but how do we analyze you know, this problem here? Okay, so let's figure out the first part first. Pick five lucky numbers from one to 59, and I'm 100% sure that in this case, those numbers cannot overlap. In other words, you, have, you are supposed to pick five unique numbers from one to 59, okay? So with the first number, you have 59 choices, right? And once you have picked out the first number, then you have 58 choices for your second one. Then you have 57 for the third one. And then you have 56 for the fourth. And then 55 for the fifth number, okay? And in this case, you know, because this, the Powerball number can, can go from one to 35, and it can overlap with the first five number. So you have exactly 35 choices as the Powerball number. Okay, this is the number of, um, let's see, this is the number of combinations that you have. Excuse me, this is the number of permutations, not combinations, because you know, the ordering is actually uh, important in this case. Okay, so when you look at this one here, the, the multiply by 35 is kind of on its own, so we'll, we'll take care of this later. But if you look at this one here, um, you can pick one, two, three, four, five. You can pick five, four, three, two, one. One, two, five, four, three, and so on. You know, and they're still considered you know, the same combination. So this is not the actual number of combinations. It's a lot more than what we are dealing with here. So what we need to do is to divide this number by the number of permutations that is possible, given you know five things. Okay, so you have to divide this by five times four times three times two times one in order to give you the number of unique combinations because we want to make, basically say, make sure and say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one, and all the other permutations with the same five numbers are not considered unique. So you have to divide the number of permutations by the number of combinations when you choose five items. Is that making any sense? OK. 
kind of. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just struggling to kind of understand it. Like, okay. Straight question. <laughs> so, say again. I don't have a straight question. I just. Oh, okay. I'm trouble understanding it. Okay. So okay. let's think about you know, um, a case here. Okay. So the first number you have 559 choices. Okay, so let's say you pick, you know, okay, 46 is the first number. And then you just say, well, okay, you know, I like a 42 as a second number, uh, maybe 55, um, 6, and 10. Okay? So in your mind, you basically thought, okay, I, I want these numbers in my, you know, as my lucky numbers. Okay? But these lucky numbers can be reordered. Okay, so you can pick these things you know, in a sorted order, like 6, 10, 42, 46, and 55. These two permutations are considered the same thing when you purchase the lotto ticket. Okay, so that's, why, that's what we have to do is to figure out, okay, out of five things, how many different ways can I reorganize the same five things and they're still considered the same combination? So that's why we have to divide it by five or five times four times three times two times one, because if this number is representing the number of permutations out of choosing five items out of 59 you know, possible items. But if those are permutations. When you play lotto, you are considering the number of combinations. So the way to convert permutations into combination is to divide the number of permutations by the number of possible combinations per, you know, the, by the, excuse me, I'll take it back, by the number of permutations per combination. You, you, you're given exactly the five things, how many different ways can you rearrange the ordering of those five things? So that's why we have to divide it by your know, five factorial. Okay? So this is related to factorial because how do we get these, um, this number calculated? In other words, how do we get this first part, you know, calculated? using only factorial. Well, 59 times 58, okay, I'm gonna be a little bit lazy here. Okay, this thing is actually, you know, 59 factorial, 59 factorial divided by 54 factorial. Does that make sense? that 59 times 58 times 57 times 56 times 55 is really 59 factorial divided by 54 factorial. 600 million? Well, if you expand it, it becomes obvious. Okay, so let's take a look at the expansion of this thing here. 59 factorial is 59 times 58 times 57 times 50 6 times 55 times 54 times 53 times blah 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 all the way down to 1. Uh, 54 factorial, it's not very exciting. 54 times 53 times blah 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 down to 1. So when you divide both of these terms, okay, so let's put a division here, what do you get out of canceling? 6 million. You get 59, okay, the 54 cancels out, right? 54 cancels out, 53 cancels out, 52 cancels out, all the way down to one. So what you're left is 59, 58, 57, 56, and 55, which is what we want, right? So that means, you know, the entire calculation of this calculation here can be done with, you know, so this whole thing becomes 59 factorial divided by 54 factorial first, and then the uh, quotient out of that whole thing, we have to divide it by five factorial, and then times 35, which is because you know, that, uh, those 35 choices as the Powerball is independent to the first five numbers. Are we still doing okay so far with this calculation? Okay, but you guys are interested in, but what is the actual number, right? I mean, th that's the whole point of this discussion. Let's figure it out using a spreadsheet, okay? So using a spreadsheet, we can calculate, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this step by step so that we can actually see how it works. Okay, so we want to look at 59 factorial first. It is this number, okay? The factorial of 59, it's pretty big, 
Okay, it's 1.3 something times 10 to the power of 80. Um, and then we have 54 factorial. Okay, it is the factorial of 54, which is a pretty big number, which is good, okay, because uh, that helps us uh, limit the uh, choices or the, the number of combinations. 5 factorial, you know, I think most people know this one. It is just, you know, 120. 20. Okay, so, and then we have 35 after that. Okay, so we are, the actual calculation is now, you know, this number divided by this number divided by this number times 35, which is the number of uh, choices for the Powerball. So you have this number, which is a hundred and seventy five million uh, approximately one hundred and seventy five million uh, unique choices for um, 17 billion you said 17 billion can I ask you a question um, yeah if you go back to your formula that you put up there which one the oh. formula so um, oh, wait. this one no 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 in the spreadsheet so that in the spreadsheet the, yeah this one yes shouldn't you put the division in brackets because are you trying to multiply the entire divisional problem or just the last because right now what it's doing is it's it, it's, dividing. it's implicit in division the uh, association is actually implicit so whether I put you know parentheses around it doesn't matter it's it's done already but the times you said 35 the order. at the end it's not dividing by the last cell times no. 35 no, the times 35 is, you know, is also independent. So I can put in extra parentheses, and it would not actually change the end result. So you basically want to do this. It doesn't change it. So when you look at this number, it is 175 million choice. Uh, yep. Sorry, I'm not sure where the 54 factorial came from again. Which one? The 54 factorial. The 54 factorial. OK, the 54 factorial is here. Okay, we want to figure out what is um, this number. Okay, but that number is fifty-nine factorial divided by fifty-four factorial, because if we have fifty-nine factorial, you have you know this is fifty-nine factorial, this is fifty-four factorial, so fifty-four factorial basically you know, get gets rid of you know this part of the first number of the fifty-nine factorial. So we are only left, after we cancel out the terms, we only get five terms left. And that's how we get to 59 times 58 times everything down to 55. Yep. I think it'd be easier if it were just uh, 59 choices that we, 59 numbers we could pick, it'd be 59 factorial. But since there's only five, that's why we're dividing by 54 factorial. Correct. In, the, in fact, you know, I think so you do see if I line them up like that. <laughs> because this is a division, you know, this is. This, this is my attempt to kind of approximate the um, division operation. Yep. Where did that 35 came from? 55? No, 35. 35? Yeah. So That's part of the game. That's how yeah. the game is played is, you know, one Powerball number from oh. 1 to 35. Okay. Yep. We've got to, got to read the instructions carefully, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's your money on the line. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So after the calculation, we come up with uh, what is the number here? Okay, okay. We better reformat this number so it's easier to read. So you can go to numbers and then select uh, number and then use comma to separate the digits a little bit. Okay, so now it's very clear. It is one hundred and seventy-five million. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And how much uh, do you pay for each ticket? Is it still a buck? Powerballs two. Two bucks. Holy moly, two bucks. <laughs> 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 two. Okay, all right. So when is it worthwhile to spend two bucks to buy a ticket? Uh, what, what, what needs to be the payoff? Over our <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be twice that, right? Okay, you know, because you know, your, your chance to win, assuming there is no other factors, like if you're the only lotto player <laughs> in the entire state of California, assuming that you're the only player, then you, your chances of actually getting a ticket, you know, winning, is one over 175 million. I think you can win partially, right? You know, you can like match everything except for the Powerball. So let's not consider you know all the other ones. You know, let's just consider the the big price, okay? 
So your chance of winning is one over that number. Okay, so let's let's take a look at the, what what kind of magnitude we are talking about here. One divided by this number. That's your chances of actually getting the right number. Okay. So if you want to if you want this opportunity to balance out the two bucks that you paid, then you're looking at the payoff. You know, has to be two divided by the chance that you're going to win. So the this is the payoff money that has to be you know two worth two worth your two bucks. Okay, this has to be the uh, what is the is it called the payoff? Payout. 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 Yeah. Okay, so this has to be the prize money, the three hundred and fifty million dollars. But that's based on you know a simple assumption that you're the only person player, because if the if the payout is three hundred and fifty million dollars, there will be a whole lot more people buying multiple tickets. So that means your chances of being the only winner is going to be a lot slimmer. If you're not the only winner, then you have to you know, share the prize money with other people. So then you need to factor that in and just say, okay, historically, when the pay, uh, when the uh, when the payoff, not payoff, payout, when the payout amount is huge, traditionally, you know, how many people tend to have the same tickets? Two, three? I don't know. I mean, do you guys know? Two. Okay, let's say it's two. Okay. So if, if traditionally there are usually about at least two people you know, getting the same ticket when the payout money is this large, then you have to factor in factor that in and say that you know it has to be at least seven hundred million dollars as the payout to worth your two bucks to pay the, to pay, to play this game. But you're forgetting what something important. You're forgetting Uncle Sam. Got tax. <laughs> okay. So with state and federal tax combined, you know, out of you know this amount of money. How much do you have to pay, you know, as taxes? Uh, almost sixty percent. Let's say half. Okay, let's just say half. Okay, so that means you know you have to double this again, and say that you need at least one point four billion dollars as the payout to worth your two bucks to buy a single ticket. What if you buy two tickets? Well, double that amount. <laughs> well, that gives you a kind of a general sense of you know order of magnitude of you know when is it worth my money to play this game to you know, spend two bucks on the lotto ticket, <laughs> or you can just you know say I feel lucky today. <laughs> yep. What you're saying is not when to spend two bucks, but you're saying you could 100 percent win if the payout was this much. You could buy every combination. Uh, no, it's well. You can say that. You can also basically say, you know, this. This is just breaking even. Okay, you're not even pocketing money. This is just a breaking even. You know, based on you know the two bucks that you spend and the probability that you will get, you know, the the right combination, and you know factoring in you know how many other people will be also buying a lot of tickets, um, and also you know state and federal taxes. So this is just you know breaking even over you know like playing a lot of lot of you know, games. This is just breaking even. That's one way to look at it. Okay, you know, but yep, go ahead. Um, I was just saying, you're the only person buying the ticket. Your payout is two dollars. Isn't that it? Ticket. If you're the only, if you're the only person buying the bottle, uh -huh. isn't it based on how many people buy a ticket? Because different people can pick out the same five, no, the same you're six the numbers. Only if you're the only person, yeah. If you're the only person, then you only need um, this much money to break even, because you still have to pay your taxes. You still have to pay your taxes. I think you, you okay. You you need this. Let's see. If you pay your taxes, you still need okay. This is based on two bucks. Okay, you're spending two bucks per ticket. Okay, and this number is based on you know you have to pay your federal and state taxes. And this number is based on there will be a whole lot of other people buying tickets too. So you have to share your prize money with the other person who has just the same exact same numbers. Yep. Okay. What's the chance of you getting the same numbers that person? Mm -hmm. 
No, there are a lot of people buying tickets because there are uh, there are only 175 million unique you know num unique tickets, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, how many tickets are sold when the payout money is you know this amount? Do you think you know the the lotto you know will there will be at least you know, 175 million tickets sold when the payoff is 175 million dollars? That's the question. I think the Lotto's the website you know, probably has obligation to tell you, you know, historically speaking, you know, how many people buy tickets because you know, they need to provide all the information that you need to figure out the math because otherwise it will be hiding you know, the truth from you know, people who buy tickets and that would not be lawful. Well, can we check if they have it on there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Now you say play, believe. They did tell you statistics. Yeah, they should. What are you putting up the draw? Sorry? <coughs> yep. Oh, the same number we worked out. Yep. But they don't tell you the number of people who play and how many tickets are traditionally sold when, a, when the payout money is a certain amount, which is what is actually important, is how many tickets are actually sold. Because if they sell twice the, this number of tickets, you know, if they sell you know, 300 and something million tickets, that means the chances of somebody else having exactly the same number as you do is pretty high. Okay? So even if you win in that case, you'll be one of the two people of exactly the same number, so you have to share the prize money. And it doesn't take much you know, for 300 and 50 you know million tickets sold because you know one person can buy 10 by right, 20 and they have pools you know when you go to work you know people you know, operate you know pools you know they would pull money together and they buy like a whole bunch of tickets like hundreds of tickets but it still boils down to statistics okay and some people can ignore statistics and just say well you know what that applies to most people but you know what I'm lucky <laughs> <laughs> well, I cannot, I cannot argue against that sort of thing. But I can just show you the number. Like, okay, you know, that's the number. Yep. Are there any questions about this? Then how does that work against like? Hmm? How does that? How does that work against? Uh, of course, huge. it doesn't. It of course, it's not going to be on your side. I mean, you know, the the chances of, is always on the side of Lotto because you know, what is the whole idea of Lotto? Which is kind of ironic, in a way. Okay, where does that money go? It goes to the state, doesn't it? It goes to the state, but it doesn't go into general fund. It goes to where? I don't recall. I don't know. California Lotto. <coughs> Who gets the money? Okay. Contribution to education. There we go. There we go. Contribution to education. So this very same source that is funding a part of my paycheck, <laughs> and I'm talking about Lotto in my class, and, but I'm giving you guys the truth. I'm giving you guys the tools to compute the opportunities and the chances of winning, okay? What about going to a casino? What do you think is your, are your chances of actually winning you know, by going to a casino? Depending what Depends on what game. It yeah. depends on what game, but on the average, you know, the chance is going to be on whose side? The house. Kids, the house. casino house, exactly. Because in fact, if you go to a casino, the the more bright lights, you know, the, the better the drink, you know, the better the air conditioning, the better the interior decoration, the less likely you're going to win because that money to maintain the casino has to come from somewhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I don't even need to use a calculator or factorial or a spreadsheet to come up with the conclusion of, okay, I'm gonna lose money here, I'm just gonna do it for entertainment. Okay, that's the only thing you know, to do, to, to look at, the only way to look at it, yep. The funny thing is that there are people that are like statistics vultures mm -hmm. who sit and watch everyone. Mm -hmm. So if you've been on one game for say an hour, yeah. they're marking down your payouts. Yeah. So they know that if you get up and yeah. you've had low payouts, then statistically it'll be a higher payout. So they'll, they'll sit and stake out your receipt. Uh, it's pretty funny to watch. It does work. It does work? 
You can also yeah, uh, can have a 66 percent chance of winning at roulette. Well, they, that's not counting cards or anything like that. It's, it's oh. just <coughs> stats. Oh. So it's not illegal. Well, I think the casinos also you know, collect statistics. You know, oh yeah. You know, the house also oh. do that own you know that's analysis too. Yep, go ahead. Oh, that, that's right. Casinos they take out the high pay machines. Like they, when they start paying out, paying out, paying out, they you see them being removed. You mean the slot machines? Yeah, like slot, slot machines. For example, the Wheel of Fortune is giving payouts. They, I guess they do like defective. And they <laughs> they, they create their own electrical search to take out their own slot machines. It's like, oops, oh, no. it's gone now. Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, if you and if you start winning a lot at blackjack, they send someone over to like look at you. Mm -hmm. I've had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember the movie Rain Man. You know, I'm not sure how many of you watched the movie Rain Man. You know, he is a. Uh, uh, what is his condition? You know, autistic savant. Yeah, he's autistic, but he has the insane ability to you know, remember things, photographic memory. So, and he can basically remember what cards have to be played in a card game, and by doing that, you know, he can basically tip the scale and say, okay, you know, what is the likelihood of this is going to be the next card? Okay, because if you don't keep track of all the cards that has been played, then you know, the chance is definitely on the house. But if you can actually look at all the cards that have been played out already, you can actually make a much better decision of whether to you know, hit me or not. So he was using that you know, on, you know, to, uh, to an advantage, and didn't they get throw, thrown out of the uh, casino as a you result? Card because you're not supposed to count cards? Yeah. yeah but how they have multiple shoes now, because a shoe is a book. Okay. And if you have multiple shoes, then people aren't just going by that one shoe because that's how the card counters come in. So I see. They just said, well, we'll just have three or four shoes, mm -hmm. depending upon how many players are at the table. I see. So you can't set it down. You can still do it, but now you have to prob you're, well, they you have to factor in three instead of mm -hmm. one. Yeah, but destroy the cards after they're done. Mm -hmm. Destroy the cards to get new board. Well, no, no. What what they're doing now, or what they've done for a while, is like once it, after each hand is dealt, they just put it back into a machine. It all randomly shuffles five decks, so you can't, it's impossible to count since uh -huh. they're constantly five decks are constantly randomly shuffled. Uh huh. Wow, she's got to way to take the shoe and just shred it. Last time you know. I went to a casino was nineteen ninety two. I only went there because of the buffet. You can you can look at the buffet as a you know, it, as a definite it. lost proposition no, because I'm just paying money to eat. But I'm also making sure that I'm getting what I want because you know I know, you know what I'd like to eat and you know so. There you go. Oh, you can start with that. He was behind the monitor, so I couldn't see. <laughs> All right. Well, so that's what that's what factorial is. But getting back to the original point of how does this relate to recursion, right? I mean, that was the whole idea. But I didn't want to talk about something that is yeah, not very useful. So let's go back to recursion here. So let me close these tabs here and go to recursion. Talk about recursion. All right. So what we can do now is to look at uh, factorial in a slightly different way. Okay, so let's just you know, take five factorial. Okay, we have seen five factorial already. It's five times four times three times two times one. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. But you can use the associative property of multiplication and reorder things just a little bit. Okay, so what if I reorder this so it becomes the following? It is still five times four times three times two times one, but I'm grouping these four together. What exactly is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1? 24. 24. It's 24, but what is the other name of that? Four. Isn't that 4 factorial? Yeah. It's 4 factorial. Oh, okay. So 5 factorial can be defined as 5 times 4 factorial. What about 4 factorial? 4 factorial can be seen as 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, but just by using the associative property of multiplication, I can group 3 times 2 times 1 together, and what is that? 4 times 3 factorial. Is it is 3 factorial? This is where recursion comes in, is the definition of a particular operator, like factorial, can be expressed by itself, only on a smaller number. 
Okay? So if you look at it this way, then one way to define factorial is, you know, n factorial has two cases. n factorial is one for when n equals to zero. n factorial equals to n times the factorial of n minus one when n is greater than zero. That's one way to look at, you know, n factorial is it is recursive. Okay? <coughs> To perform an operation, sometimes, but in this case, most of the time, you have to apply the same operation, but on a smaller number in this case. Okay. Are there any questions about the recursive definition of factorial? Why is n when, when n equals zero, why is it n factorial equal to one? Because when you have nothing, then the number of comp the number of permutations is going to be one. There's only one way to arrange nothing. Okay. <laughs> that's what, that's basically by definition. You know, when you have n factor zero factorial is one is by definition. Okay. What if you end up a number between one and two, like one point five is two. N can only be an integer. Oh, yeah. Can only be a non-negative integer or a natural number. Are there any questions about this part? Any questions? So only a whole number will work. Hmm? You can only use whole numbers there. You can only use, well, whole numbers, you know, does whole numbers include zero? Because I thought whole numbers only go from one and up. Natural numbers, hmm. at least when I learn natural numbers, it includes zero. All right. Hmm. So this is all kind of interesting. So now the question is, how do we write an algorithm to compute, you know, n factorial? Well, using recursion, it turns out to be eh, not really you know, convenient, at least not the way we look at recursion at this point. So we'll go ahead and take a look at you know, that uh, recursive definition of factorial, of n factorial, and say, well, how do we do this you know, using an algorithm? But before we do that, let's do it you know, without using recursion first. Okay? So without recursion, how do we find the, the factorial of n? So what we do is we have to you know, start with the product of p, and then you say, and you have to start with another number, let's say x here. So x starts with 1 as well. And then you basically say, as long as x is less than or equal to n, do the following. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to say the product is updated by the product times x. And then we increment x by 1 and y. So this is how we can do, uh, this is how we can compute um, factorial, not recursively. So let's take a look at this algorithm and check it and you know, test it a little bit before we move on. Right. So we do have one condition on line three to evaluate. We have line number, and now we have three variables. We have n, we have x, and then we have p for the product. The precondition is I have to give you an n, which is the num whose factorial am I going to compute. So in this case, let's pick a smaller number. There's no need to really pick a huge number here. So let's pick four as, you know, so we want to compute four factorial. Um, x starts with an unknown value, p starts with an unknown value because they will be initialized in the algorithm itself. All right, first line initializes p to 1, second line initializes x to 1, third line has a condition to evaluate, x is 1, 1 is less than or equal to 4, which is n is true, then we move on to line 4. Okay. Line 4 is multiplying p, which is 1, by x, which is also 1. 1 times 1 is 1, and we store that back into the product, which is 1. On line 5, we add 1 to x. x goes from 1 to 2, and then we go back to line 3, because this is a loop. x is less than or equal to n is true. like really fast. Oh. Do you know that? No. <laughs> okay. My going to take a pause here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I have it. Sure. 
Okay, so now you know we the condition is still true, then we move on to line four again. Line four is computing the product between p and x. x is two, p is one, the product is two, and we store that into the product which is p. So now the you know, p is updated to a value of two. We move on to line five, we add one to x, x goes from z two to three. We go back to line three. X has a value of three. 3 is less than n, which has a value of 4, is true, less than or equal to. And then we move on to line 4 again. And this time, the product is between 3 and 2, which is 6. We store the product into p. We move on to line 5. We add 1 to x. x is now 4. We go back to line 3. x is 4. n is 4. 4 is less than or equal to 4 is true. true. We move on to line 4. So this time it is between 6 and 4. The product is 24. We store that back into uh, variable p. We move on to line 5. x is incremented from 4 to 5. We go back to line 3. x is now 5. 5 is less than or equal to n, which is 4. is false. We get out of the loop. There's nothing after. So the post is, you know, we get the post. So this is one way to compute the factorial of a number. Um, using just you know a loop, but without using recursion. But we look at this and go like, well, we know we can do this with recursion too, because you know that's you know, something that we can we can do. So let's go take a look at the recursive um, definition of factorial, which is not going to be pretty at this point. Okay, so we'll define you know factorial as a subroutine, and what we'll do is we'll start with a conditional statement. So we're going to use the same type of variable here. We will basically say if n, if x is less than or equal to, uh, let's see, I'm 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 just think, thinking you know how I want to do this. I can do it the same way as before. So I can say you know, if x is less than or equal to n, then we got something to do. So what we'll do is we'll compute the product to become p times x here. And then we'll increment x by 1, so x get x plus 1. And then we'll do the recursion. We'll say invoke factorial here. And if, and define sub. So don't copy this until or unless you know the indentation already, that's OK too. So we'll go ahead and go back to the indentation. And then we'll initialize n to a particular value. Um, this one is a little bit extreme, so I'll start with you know three, you know, because otherwise we'll have a lot of you know allocation of columns and the allocation of columns. So n getting three is a good one. P is initialized to one just like before, and x is initialized to one just like before. And then we invoke you know factorial from outside factorial to trigger the operation. Let's take a look at this algorithm. And figure out, okay, is that really going to do the same thing? I don't see a loop here. Because remember, most of the time we need a loop in order to perform you know, factorial. But this one does not have a loop. It only has a conditional statement inside a subroutine. But because the subroutine itself is recursive, that makes it possible. All right. We have 10 minutes remaining. I think we got enough time to do this. So we have comments. We have my number. We have the three variables just like before. So we got n, which really doesn't change over time. We have x and p, and those two do change over time. And the first line, OK, the precondition is you know we don't need to know anything, because in this case, n is initialized inside the algorithm itself. So there's no need to do any type of assumption in this particular case. On line 8, n is initialized to 3. On line 9, p is initialized, initialized to 1. And then on line 10, x is initialized to 1 as well. So the initialization is about the same as the previous uh, algorithm, which is just relying on a loop. Now we get to line 11, invoke factorial. We allocate the leftmost available column and then call it return line number. In this case, you know, when we come back, we are all done. So the return line number is post. And then we continue into the subroutine starting on line two. 
x has a value of 1, 1 is less than or equal to n, which is 3 is true. <clears throat> and then we move on to line 3. Line 3 just wants to compute the product between x and p, which is 1. And then we store that back into p, which is, you know, the same, out, the same column e. We move on to line 4. It adds 1 to x. x goes from 1 to 2. And then we get to line 5, which is the recursive column. Well, we have done this at the beginning of the entire class, so we are going to do about the same thing here. The invocation allocates the leftmost available column. Remember where we are supposed to go back to. Where are we supposed to go back to this time? Seven. Line 7. Okay. Because line 6 is a line that we do not trace, so logically speaking, we actually continue execution on line 7. And then we, the second step of invoking is to go back to the beginning of the entire subroutine, which is on line 2. So now we are back to line 2. x is less than or equal to n is true, because x has a value of 2 at this point, n is 3. So now we do line 3 again. Line 3 is computing the product between 2 and 1, and that would give us a product of 2. We go to line 4. We add 1 to x. x goes from 2 to 3. And then we go to line 5. Line 5 is invoke, an invoke statement. We allocate the leftmost available column to return, to remember the return line number, which is once again line 7, because the invoke statement is on line 5. And then we continue execution in the subroutine that we're invoking, starting from the very beginning of the entire subroutine, which is line 2. x is 3, n is 3, 3 is less than or equal to 3 is true. So we go to line 3 again. The product of six, 3 and 2 is 6. Then we go to line 4. We add 1 to x. x goes from 3 to 4. And at this point, I have lost my the top columns or the top rows. I can use this little feature here to separate the screen so that I can still look at the header of each column without losing that. Okay. So after we are done with line 4, we go on to line 5. Yep. Um, I'm sorry. Are you moving that fast because we only have a few minutes? Because I can't even like process. Okay, you might want to focus on the screen because you know it is being recorded. It is still being recorded, so you can focus on the screen and just kind of understand, you know, in general how it's all done. It's really the same thing that we did earlier, except we threw in you know some multiplication, you know, in this case. But for the most part, it's the same kind of you know trace that we did at the beginning of the class. So you might want to just you know focus on the screen, you know, just kind of focus on, on what I'm talking instead of copying. Um, yep. Another question: Why does this subroutine keep looping? Because when we go to the end of find subroutine, why are we going back up to line two? Because we have invoked factorial on line five. Oh, okay. Because you know the invoke statement has two things to do. The first one is to remember where we're supposed to go back to, okay. and then the second thing that it does is to go to the subroutine starting from the very beginning of the subroutine. Okay. That is why it looks like a loop because we are going back to a certain line. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are on our last iteration here. So on line five, we do the invoke again. We allocate the leftmost available column. Remember that we are supposed to go back to line 7, and then we continue execution on line 2, because that's the second thing that an invoke statement is supposed to do, is to continue, ex continue execution at the beginning of a particular subroutine. x is less than or equal to n is false this time, because x now has a value of 4, and n only has a value of 3 from you know, like before. Okay, So since the condition is false, we do not get into line 3 we skip all the way to line 7 this time. On line 7, we are at the end of a subroutine. It has got two things to do. It has to look up the leftmost available call, uh, return line number, and say, oh, excuse me, I take it back. It has to look up the rightmost active return line number. In this case, it is column I. Column I tells us to continue, continue execution on line 7. So this line 7 here, this one comes from here. But I'm still executing this line seven, and the second thing, uh, the second thing you have to do at the end of a subroutine is to deallocate the column for that return line number, and then I use strike through to indicate that it is now deallocated. All right, which is the, the same thing that we do with any subroutine. 
And now we are on line seven again. We have to look up the rightmost active return line number. It's not column I anymore because we just deallocated it. So the rightmost active return line number is now column H. But column H tells me, well, pretty much the same thing, continue execution on line seven. So now we have to put that, put that line seven over here and then continue execution of this line seven, which means we have to deallocate column H as the second step at the end of the subroutine. Just like that. Now we are on this line seven. Once again, we have to look up the rightmost active return line number. It is column G. Column G tells us to return to continue execution on line seven. So we'll, we'll make a note of that. And then we have no use of that column anymore. So column G is now deallocated. We're on line seven yet again. So we have to do exactly the same thing. Look up the rightmost active return line number. Column G, H, and I are now deallocated. So column F is the only return line number left, which also makes it the rightmost return line number. It tells us to continue execution at post. We make a note of that. And then we have no use of column F anymore. We deallocate column F at this point, And then we continue execution at post, which means we are done. We are at the end of the entire trace. This is the trace. OK, let me just zoom out a little bit, just so that we can see the shape of how the columns are used of the entire thing. Okay, one more time. There we go. So this is the trace of the recursive version of factorial. Okay. Are there any questions about this trace? I know I went kind of fast. Yep, go ahead. Well, the, the one that you did before had the loop in it. We were able to get the product of 24, which is the factorial of 4, right? Right. But this one didn't have the same product. Which was well, this one only goes up to 3, because otherwise you know, I, would have, you know, I have to use more columns. So I'm only computing the factorial of 3 in this case. The factorial. But if we were able to go back to line 3, we would have got the 6 and 4 and then down near line. <laughs> if you change the previous one to compute the factorial of 3, it would come up as 6. Because 3 times 2 times 1 is 6. That's, you know, 3 factorial is the right answer. So this one worked correctly. It's just that I started up with a smaller, you know, n. Instead of 4, I started with 3. Are there any questions? Okay. Well, the most important part you have to get out of this class is the way we evoke a subroutine does not change. What I talked about last Thursday is exactly the same thing that I talked about today. Where the invoke is does not matter. It can be outside of a subroutine, can be inside a subroutine, can be invoking the same subroutine that it's in. It does not matter. The way the return, uh, the way you process and define sub also does not change no matter where you are. Okay? And also, in this case, you can end up on the same line. In this case, it'll be on line seven, and the return line number tells us to continue execution on line seven again. That's entirely possible, and it's okay. So all you have to do is to follow these operations at the low level, and then it will all work out. Okay. Are there any questions about, you know, invoking a subroutine or returning from a subroutine. Does the invoke know that line seven is the word where it was to end? How does the invoke know? Okay, because the invoke is on line five, mm -hmm. and then we have to remember when we come back from factorial, where are we supposed to continue execution? Now, because this invoke statement on line five is the last item or the last line inside the conditional statement, so when we come back, we have to continue execution after the conditional statement. Okay. But the conditional statement has no other statements after that. So the only thing after that is line seven, which is the end of a subroutine. Now the end of a subroutine is not the same as the end of a while loop, which really doesn't do anything. The end of a subroutine actually has got two important things to do, which is to look up the rightmost active return line number, make a point to continue execution over there, and then deallocate that column. So that's why the line seven is actually something that we have to do something about, and that's why it becomes the return line number when we have an invoke on line five. Okay. Right. Okay, I know that I went a little bit fast on certain parts of this lecture, but since it's all recorded, <coughs> you can kind of go to you know, a certain portion and just kind of play the portion you think you might have missed. All right, I'll see you.
you guys on Thursday. Jack. Yep. You have uh, 26 points on the lunch it was on the midterm. And the homework that we have to do on Thursday is 20 points on so is the percentage allocated a lot? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, remember, all the homework assignments only add up to 20% of your final grade. Right. So that means, you know, that is 20 points out of whatever total right. number of points. And that only adds up to 20% of your final grade. Yep. Yeah. Quick, quick question. Um, why does the 11 invoke factorial uh, not end on line 7? Because, because the invoke statement...